What's up guys? My name is Jake. Welcome to Abandoned, episode 22. This of course is the show where we talk about some of the most interesting abandoned places in the world. So we all know how interested I am in massive retail store collapses. We've talked about Target Canada and Blockbuster Video, but there's always been one retail store known for its absolutely massive and public collapse, and that's Circuit City. Now if you don't know what Circuit City is, I'll give you a quick rundown. Basically, it was an American-based company that sold electronics. Essentially, if you know what Best Buy is, then you know what Circuit City is. So all the way back in 1949, a man named Samuel S. Wurzel opened the first Ward's Company store, which sold televisions. The idea came to him while he was on vacation and witnessing the emerging market of the television. This market proved to be pretty good to come into when sales were pretty steady and more stores were continuing to open around the country. By 1959, the company had four stores in all different states and has sales volumes of around a million dollars. As years passed, the company continued to grow in both size and number of stores. By 1977, Wards began testing stores under the conceptual idea of the modern superstore. And with these test stores only selling electronics and bringing in good numbers for the company, the brand began changing its store names from Wards to Circuit City. The company began shuttering the smaller, lesser known subsidiary stores and focusing entirely on the big box store concept. And by the end of 1979, the company was bringing over $120 million in sales. As the Wards company continued to move in the direction of Circuit City, in 1984, the company officially changed its corporate name to Circuit City. Also during this time, the company was listed on the New York Stock Exchange for the first time. Now in retail terms, these stores began to really change the game on what consumers experienced in an electronics store. Under the new CEO, the company began building and replacing regular Circuit City stores with the new Circuit City Superstores. These new stores featured entire filled walls of televisions and unique media displays. New themed pathways around the store equaled organization and smooth customer flow. More desirable products were placed towards the back of the store to encourage people to walk through more of the store. All these techniques for retail were very innovative and really did change the game on what we even see now. In 1984, Circuit City had 113 operating stores. By this time in our first world culture, the stores were growing faster as more emerging consumer technology came to the market, such as cordless telephones, microwave ovens, and VCRs. When moving into a single area, Circuit City would intelligently open a large amount of very large stores with heavy marketing and efficient distribution. This would allow the company to top the local shares in the market. The expansion strategy proved to be effective when in 1987, Circuit City reached a billion dollars in sales for the first time. For the most part, this quick jump was driven in part by the increasing demand for VCRs, which in return put more demand on other products they were known for, such as televisions and audio equipment. And by 1988, the company was at the top of the nation's electronic store market share. And with this, in 1989, Circuit City sales had doubled from the sales they had announced in 1987. In the early 90s, Circuit City was growing at a rapid rate, and by 1993, the company had over 300 stores with more than 200 on the way. However, competition began with Circuit City and Best Buy, with price cuts being made on both ends which sparked an everlasting pricing war between the two companies. The like up Circuit City had on Best Buy was their service, as Circuit City was all about helping customers find what they were looking for, as the employees were paid on commission, as Best Buy was based on a find-it-yourself basis. Circuit City stood by this position when in 1994 the company proved that customers preferred Circuit City over Best Buy. Even though analysts claim that the market was extremely competitive, Circuit City brought in over $7 billion in sales by 1995, and with rising projections of 20% annually. In 1993, the company deviated from its original business model when it oddly decided to open a chain of used car lots which later became CarMax. And just two years into their new subsidiary, the chain was bringing in pretty good numbers for the company. Honestly, CarMax was a great company to bring to the lucrative and rather sketchy market that was used car lots, and CarMax innovated a lot in the industry. It was kinda odd to see a massive electronic retailer get into the used car industry, however it proved to be a great decision for the company. For now. 
It was good that the company had a strong secondary revenue stream, as the electronic market became a little more saturated, and in 1996, Best Buy surpassed Circuit City as the new number one electronic retailer. It didn't help that CarMax was beginning to lose money for the company, and by 1998 the chain had lost over $23.5 million. With this, all future expansion for CarMax was halted. However, by the following year, Circuit City itself was doing very well. The company revenue was pushing $10 billion. With the 2000s approaching and the company switching up its leadership roles, the executive decision was made to remove the appliance section from its stores in favor of focusing more on consumer electronics. The company had generated over 14% of its revenue from the appliance side, however with increasing competition from stores like Home Depot, the decision was just made to cut the departments from the stores. With this, six Circuit City distribution centers closed and a thousand staff members had lost their jobs. While this was going on, the company began its $1.42 billion overhaul and refurbishment to their 570 stores. This refurbishment would eliminate the appliance section from their stores and boost the section of the now popular DVDs, video games, and other consumer electronics. These new stores mirrored what Best Buy had with their self-service and customer-friendly approach. The layout would feature wider aisles, open layouts, and more floor space. The introduction of shopping carts into the stores began, as well as employees remaining on commission pay, something that Best Buy dissolved back in 1989. As the refurbishments rolled out to their stores worldwide, they were almost immediately hurt by the increasing weak retail market and the ever-growing Best Buy chain. During this time, Circuit City had decided to separate CarMax from the main company, and by 2002, CarMax was separately traded. In 2003, the company had finally decided to terminate the employee's commission pay and adopt a standard hourly wage pay. This move reduced 3,900 commission-paid employees to now 2,100 waged-pay employees. In 2004, the company closed 19 underperforming stores, and this was kind of showing the weakening of the company's finances. In February of 2004, overall company sales fell 2%, bringing the company's net sales to $9.75 billion. This coupled with the chain's 600 stores barely profitable and their previous tax charges, the company reported a net loss of $85 million. Even with the loss, Circuit City was determined to turn things around with an ambitious plan to open 65 to 70 new stores. Even though about half of these would be relocations, the company wanted to find a better and more profitable locations by eliminating ones that worked against that. During 2004, the company made some big ticket purchases by acquiring Music Now, an online music store, and a company called Intertan. The $300 million acquisition of Intertan was interesting because the company operated nearly a thousand outlets in Canada under some popular names such as Radio Shack, Rogers Plus, and Battery Plus. Circuit City believed that this agreement would allow an easy entrance to Canada, a market that Best Buy had been already taking over with. However, since Radio Shack separated itself from the company way back in the 80s, a legal suit was filed against them for using the name in Canada. In 2005, Radio Shack won their case against Circuit City, and they were forced to rebrand the stores into The Source. As for the main company, profits continued to slow. The company's stock was beginning to slump down, but honestly, things began to recover quite well. In 2007, the company unveiled the next step in their evolution as a brand, a concept they had called The City. The idea was to utilize the space more effectively and cut down on their massive floor space. This idea would allow the company to explore other markets in this new format. As Best Buy was booming in sales, Circuit City began to struggle, and in February the company closed 7 domestic stores along with an entire distribution center to cut back operating costs. And it was made much worse when the company began to show great weakness by its CFO resigning. It was the third resignation of a senior executive in the company within a six month period. Also in 2007, Circuit City announced they would be decreasing their employees' starting wage from $8.75 to $7.40 an hour. If you remember our Blockbuster video, I mentioned that Blockbuster of all companies offered to buy Circuit City for a billion dollars. However, this deal was retracted not too long after this, and Circuit City was on a course that saw its end. Circuit City continued to lose millions of dollars each month, and as 2008 came in, each quarter the company would announce losses of hundreds of millions of dollars. 
As stock continued to drop, Circuit City CEO resigned on September 22nd, 2008. A new acting CEO was issued, however as the company continued to lose money and desperate to become profitable, Circuit City announced they would close 155 stores and lay off 17% of their employees. And soon after, the inevitable happened. On November 10th, 2008, Circuit City had filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection. And much like Blockbuster, the company's stock fell under a dollar a share and was delisted from the New York Stock Exchange. Circuit City was approved to borrow $1.1 billion to finance its operations in an effort to restructure the company. The company was valued at $3.4 billion in assets, however with an outstanding debt of $2.23 billion. The company's CEO promised that the remaining stores would continue to remain open. However, despite a Mexican television company buying 28% of Circuit City, on January 10, 2009, the company announced they would need to find a buyer within 6 days, or else the company would be forced to shut its stores. So, with no bidder found, the company opted into Chapter 7 bankruptcy and announced they would be liquidating all their assets. So all of Circuit City stores began selling everything they could, and once the stores were cleaned out, the stores would permanently close. As for all Canadian operations, initially they weren't really affected by this, and the stores was soon bought by Bell Canada. During this liquidation, it was reported that 30,000 employees would lose their jobs, and on March 8, 2009, Circuit City had closed all of their stores worldwide. This left hundreds of stores completely abandoned. A massive retail giant, a 60 year old company, just all of a sudden gone. At its end, it was still the second largest electronics retail store in the world, just gone. So why did this happen? Well, the decisions made internally at Circuit City weren't the best. As the former CEO stated, in the early days it was what excited the customers, and in the later years it was what would excite Wall Street. In the early days, the company took a huge emphasis on employee culture and how they were treated. As the years went on though, management began to treat the employees as expendables and easily replaced. Management figured they knew everything and the negligence ultimately was a huge problem an upper management had. So what did end up happening with Circuit City after the initial cease of operations? Well actually right after in April of 2009, a company named Systemax signed a $6.5 million agreement to purchase Circuit City's bankrupt assets. And almost immediately after they launched a Circuit City website which dealt with online consumer electronics. And in November of 2012, CircuitCity.com would now be rebranded to turn into TigerDirect.com. This was the last time Circuit City's name would ever be used again. Until now. Yeah, usually these stories don't really end this way, so it's pretty interesting. So two New York retail veterans bought the rights to the name Circuit City in early 2016, with plans of opening a new store in June of the same year. The idea is to target millennials in a new store concept in smaller size. The new stores would be kind of a mix between Radio Shack or The Source, mixed with a little bit of Best Buy. It's not really that revolutionary, and honestly, I don't really think this is going to work out too well. The layout and the sense of what they're going for just reminds me a lot of The Source, and, and good god do I dislike The Source. It's just so bland and boring and overpriced and demit- I just- I really just don't like The Source. The projected store opening in June didn't really happen, and in a very short press release, they said they're taking their time to get it right. And it is kind of exciting to see such an iconic and nostalgic brand be revised. As of right now though, there are still a lot of old Circuit City stores completely abandoned. But honestly, this story usually doesn't end this way, and truly this brand has been given a second chance. And with smart people behind it, it might just succeed. Anyway guys, my name is Jake, follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Snapchat, and thank you very much for watching.